Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this IIEA webinar on the topic of the enlargement of the European Union. I'm Peter Gunning, a member of the Institute, and it's my pleasure to chair today's event and to introduce to you our, our two distinguished speakers. This event is part of the Future Proofing uh, Europe project of the IIEA and is supported by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Our speakers will first address us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to question and answer <coughs> with you, our audience. Both the presentation and the Q&A are on the record. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, consenting your questions as they occur to you during the uh, discussion, presentation, and we will come to certainly as many of them uh, as possible after the presentations. You can also join the discussion on X uh, using the handle at IIEA. And the uh, seminar, the webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube. It's over 50 years uh, since the first enlargement of the European, the EEC as it was then, that brought Ireland into the community and began the road from uh, six members to nine and eventually to the 27 <clears throat> that we have today. Further enlargement is now clearly on the Union's agenda. And without stealing any of the thunder from our two speakers, I think it's fair to say that this process will be complicated, it will certainly be uh, time consuming, and it will impose considerable costs. We are very fortunate to have Pervenche Berez and Nikolai von Andasta two speakers who bring a great deal of knowledge and experience to this topic. Pervenche Perez, who will speak first, was a member of the European Parliament as a socialist for over 20 years and occupied uh, chairing posts there in the economic and the social areas. She was a member of the European Convention, uh, the, the, the uh, Convention charged with drafting a constitution for Europe, which eventually morphed into the, um, the Lisbon Treaty. She is a board member currently of the Fondation Jean Jaurès, a member of the Ethic and Audit Committee of the ECB as well. Dr. Nikolai von Andarsa is head of the EU Europe Research Division uh, in the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, the SPP, in Berlin. He has specialized in German foreign policy and European integration and has advised the German government, the Bundestag, and uh, the EU Commission on Brexit and on democracy in the EU. Importantly for us here in the Institute, he is the coordinator of the Irish-German Joint Vision Forum, um, an exchange format of the German and Irish Foreign Ministries, the IIEA and the SVP. So without further ado, I invite uh, Bervanche Berez to kick off our seminar, our webinar with a presentation on the topic of um, enlargement, sailing the high seas. Bervanche, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, uh, dear chair, for this initiative. I think it's uh, always uh, very timely to uh, discuss and rediscuss this uh, report. Uh, especially because uh, we are now in a, a schedule which is in between two moments in the agenda of the European Council. Um, and this report is definitely here to be uh, to as a contribution to the debate in the European Council. This is exactly its uh, target. And why am I saying that we are in between two of them? Well, because the last European Council confirmed that there should be a roadmap for uh, uh, the next strategic agenda of the EU, uh, taking into account uh, the target of enlargement that uh, the uh, heads of states and government have defined. And in principle, uh, you could expect that just after European Parliament selection in the next European Council would be defined what should be this roadmap. And here, if you look for good ideas to uh, fill in this uh, roadmap, I think you need to read and reread and go through uh, this report. I'm not saying this because um, I've been, I was a member of uh, this expert group, 
But because I know if you look at what's on the scene today, um, there are not so numerous contribution. Everybody's waiting for the contribution by Enrico Letta on uh, 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 the functioning of the uh, internal market or by Mario Draghi on the competition issue. But they are more focused on items that were not on our, in our mandate. The origin of our report is, uh, as it ha does happen sometime in history, uh, you, you can start with the big picture or with the small picture. And here I will speak start with the small picture. You were ahead of the 16th anniversary of the Lisbon Treaty that was going to uh, take place um, in Paris with uh, Olaf Scholz coming to visit Emmanuel Macron. And there were a lot of expectations, what's going to be in the final declaration, who is going to speak about what, and blah, blah, blah. And in parallel, you had a very, very good relationship between uh, uh, the two uh, Secretary of State for Europe, on the German side, Anna Lurman, who's still uh, uh, in this position, and Laurence Bourne, who uh, um, uh, was at that time uh, uh, Secretary of State for, for Europe in the French uh, government. They were going on very well together. And so they thought, well, there's a good base to do something into a Franco-German dimension. How do you do it? And um, their mandate, of course, covers only uh, the topic that are deal with in, in, the, in the General Affairs Council. But as you know, this is a general council, so it's, so it's quite wide in its scope, even though uh, you can say it doesn't go into the meaty greedy of all the technical uh, discussion. But this might be a good point of entry if you want to have a good Franco-German discussion. Uh, on this basis, uh, the mandate for the, the uh, expert group was defined by a joint uh, press release on the 23rd of January last year uh, with a mandate uh, that was not uh, um, duplicated in the official declaration. But of course, the two heads of states and government had agreed for the settling of this report. So this is exactly... Uh, where we stand. And um, it was six German experts versus six French experts. I'm not going to go through the whole list of the composition of the group. You can find it uh, on, on the website or in the report. And the mandate, if as we had understand it, was around a triangle. How how What needs to be done to make the EU uh, function better? When everybody knows it's going to enlarge, that's the second uh, dimension of uh, of the the, um, the, um, the the triangle. And the third one is how to make sure that uh, the uh, rule of law is respected and uh, 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 I mean even uh, improved. And around this triangle, uh, we've been working with a, a working method I have to describe because I think it's part of the success uh, of this report. Uh, first, we had to know each other and to network among us. And the way we did it was to form a couple between one French and one German expert around a theme that we had defined on the long list, uh, uh, asking the, these couple to work on, uh, to elaborate a note that would open the discussion among us. And then there could be an aller-retour between the couple and the group uh, to discuss the, the point raised in the note, in, in the written note. Um, in, the, in the beginning, we thought it would be all part of the report, but in the end, after I would say four or five months, it appeared that we knew where we wanted to go and that there were common issue uh, or common view uh, uh, sufficiently uh, described to be uh, 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 um, uh, drafted. And on this basis, then we didn't work so much on the basis of the note and we concentrate on the drafting of the of the report for which we had two rapporteur, one from the French uh, side and one from, from the German side. We used to uh, meet for two hours each, um, each uh, two, two, two times a week on the Friday morning, plus additional hearing. 
Uh, we didn't publish the list of the hearings because we didn't want to enter into diplomatic issue, but uh, we've been, uh, uh, we had hearing with uh, actual members of the commission, of the council, uh, of uh, candidate countries, official uh, uh, MEPs, um, national politics. Uh, I mean, we had a wide, quite a, a wide range of uh, hearings that allow us to have um, to, to 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 check ideas we had, and uh, to to collect also important uh, uh, ideas. Um, then, when it comes to the to the report itself, I always describe the the end result as a conservative one uh, because it's a. There are two important uh, entry points for me in the report. The first one is what we call the hybrid uh, uh, nature of the EU, which means that we don't want, we didn't want to change the balance of power inside the EU uh, between the three institutions. Uh, and by willing not to change this balance, this is why I'm saying we're we are conservative. There are, for example, some reform that we didn't discuss because they, we thought from the start that it would reshovel completely the balance of power uh, inside the commission. For example, the merge of the two function, president of the commission and president of the council. This would upset completely the, the institutional triangle and we didn't want to do it, so we, we put it aside. This is one example, there are other others. The second important thing we 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 we, we that was the framing of our thinking was that um, the basis for the EU is the rule of law. It is not so obviously uh, a present in all the text, in all the treaty and so on, but the more and more we were progressing in the drafting of the report, we were convinced that this is the key. This is what make the glue of the EU, the state of the union. And we even defined it as a prerequisite for enlargement. Uh, and this is where we do have some proposal that are quite, quite forward looking. Uh, one is uh, the first, what our favorite one of course would be to a reform of article seven. But uh, if we are not able to, to do it, which is the article on how to implement uh, a sanction when the state of the rule of law is not respected. If it's not possible, then we would like to enlarge the way the conditionality is now implemented. As you know, uh, during this mandate, there has been introduced the conditionality on the use uh, for the sake of the, of the EU budget on the use of uh, EU funds. And um, we, we see this as quite an efficient tools but we see some uh, difficulties with these tools in the fact that it does touch population that are not responsible for the behavior of the governments on the one hand, and uh, uh, that it might uh, help, it might um, push some stakeholders in governments uh, not respecting the rule of law against the EU instead of helping them to approach the EU spirit. So this is why we propose to, uh, all legal ad, uh, um, experts are not uh, uh, of this opinion, but we think uh, instead of just focusing the conditionality to the good use of public funds, it should be also linked to the respect of the value uh, and the objective of the treaty, namely of article two. Uh, of the treaty. And we think this should be a, 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 an ordinary legislative reform that should be uh, implemented. So first, no change to the triangle. Second, rule of law as number one. And third, flexibility. Because if you move from an EU of uh, uh, 27 to an EU of 37, and you want to keep this triangle as it work, it means you have you need to have as a cornerstone the triangle and its good functioning and its efficiency, but the price for this is more flexibility. And this is why we have introduced 
many uh, proposals to address this uh, objective. And for example, uh, Nicola will elaborate a bit more on what we propose uh, with the treaty. But um, the, the thing is, uh, we want to have, we, and in the end, what does it mean? It means between the community method and the intergovernmental one, we always favored the first one what, with flexibility, which means not everybody needs to be on board all the time for all the policies, but it needs to be inside the community method. So it's an open uh, a door for all the one willing to join. Uh, and uh, But the compromise here is that if you do it in this format, you should allow the coalition of the willing to go ahead if they are willing to do so. And really, I think I, I'm not going to go more into the detail because I see my time is over. But I think from a strategic point of view, this would be my three main messages. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bevanche, for that introductory um, survey. Now I turn to, to Dr. Nikolai Van Anders uh, to flesh out the uh, rest of the uh, his views on the report. Yes, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you uh, very much, uh, Per Vanche, uh, for for laying out our our general ideas. I will go a little bit more in depth uh, on some of our proposals, um, but also the question on uh, treaty change, which I know is particularly tricky for Ireland, uh, and the reaction our reports uh, gathered so far in in Brussels. And um, picking up from what Per Vanche spoke about our general ideas um, after this main principle of strengthening of the rule of law, we looked uh, really in depth on how this perspective, uh, prospective enlargement would change the different EU institutions and how they should be um, adapted. Um, and maybe the best way of illustrating uh, the, the challenge ahead for us um, is if you look at uh, the numbers, uh, by coincidence, uh, the population of the six Western Balkan countries Ukraine, Moldova, and, and Georgia, so nine of the current uh, prospective uh, candidates, leaving uh, Turkey aside for the moment. So those nine have roughly uh, the population of the United Kingdom, which obviously uh, left the European Union, uh, but they would have nine times uh, the vetoes in, in the council. Uh, they would have nine times uh, the commissioners. They would have about uh, double the numbers of members of the European Parliament, since small uh, countries are uh, pre uh, represented uh, bigger in the European Parliament. Uh, but they would have only a fraction um, of the UK's economic power and would be more heterogeneous in their history, uh, in their economic uh, outlook, and also in their foreign and security policies. And based on that, we made a couple of uh, proposals. Uh, I'm not going to go into details on all of them, but I will try to highlight uh, a couple um, of them. Uh, one of the first uh, was adapting um, the Council of the EU, where, as I said, it would be uh, nine, time, uh, nine times the vetoes. Um, uh, there we propose to extend qualified majority voting uh, to all areas of policy decisions. Um, with uh, the adaptation that we said uh, there should be um, a rebalancing of voting powers uh, between uh, in favor of the smaller countries, because in many of our reach outs, we heard the fear of an, uh, too much power for France and, and Germany if there is too big of an extension of qualified majority voting. And we also included the option of opt-outs, uh, at least for new areas of qualified majority, um, reflecting to the principle of uh, flexibility that Pervanche uh, outlined. And here would be really the idea that most, if not all, policy decisions of the EU in the Council should be taken by majority voting, but with some further protections, especially for smaller, uh, smaller EU countries. Uh, a second point, and this relates to that, would be to keep the current uh, maximum number of members of the European Parliament, 751, to not make the European Parliament the, the second largest parliament in the world, it, it's almost un, un, unworkable, but that would entail uh, that especially some of the larger member states, but also uh, the others would lose a couple of uh, seats in the European Parliament and there should be a new mechanism for, for uh, distributions. Um, and if we look at the third institution, the European Commission, 
And I know that this is particularly uh, controversial in Ireland, uh, as this was uh, set in stone after the first negative vote in the referendum in Ireland and the Lisbon Treaty, we propose to come back to the original idea uh, of the Lisbon Treaty to reduce the number of uh, commissioners, either by introducing a rotation mechanism or by introducing some kind of hierarchy between uh, commissioners in order to make it uh, workable. Um, this should be still in a balance uh, to small member states, but we believe that a commission with 30, 35 uh, members sitting around the table uh, would be next to unworkable. So this should be addressed as part of uh, the, the enlargement. A couple of other points that I would like to, to highlight is that we also propose to include a more um, partic participatory uh, elements for citizens, including for citizens from candidate countries, so that uh, they are on the way to enlargement. There could already be um, engagement between citizens from different EU countries as well as the candidate countries to prepare also the democratic support that there needs to be uh, at the end of the day to enlarge the EU uh, in, in such a mechanism. Um, and, and this may be the most controversial for between the Germans and the French one we proposed um, to, uh, or at least said that the EU budget needs to increase and the decision-making for the EU budget needs to be flexibilized um, in order to prepare the EU for such an undertaking, uh, which invariably will also affect uh, the EU budget. Although we did not sort of go into details into policy areas uh, like agriculture or cohesion policy, uh, but really focused on the institutional side of things and there said, if we have this discussion about reform and enlargement, we also need to address uh, the budgetary question. A final point that I want to address, because it might also be interesting for Ireland, um, is that we proposed, as Per Vange said, uh, that along with this preparation for enlargement, that, that there also needs to be thinking about a more flexible uh, EU. Um, and there we proposed uh, really that the EU should uh, or, or that the EU of today already is organized in a way that we have a core of countries around the Eurozone, the Schengen, uh, the Schengen uh, area that are closely tight and more tightly integrated, Ireland being part of the Eurozone, but not part of Schengen, then the full European Union. And then around there, some countries uh, like uh, Norway or Switzerland, which are connected to some shape or form to the single market. And then maybe at the most outer tier, the United Kingdom, which still has this bilateral uh, trade agreement with the EU, um, works together with the EU and the European political community, but it's not in any way associated uh, with the single market. And we propose to formalize that especially sort of thinking ahead of enlargement that was to some extent misinterpreted in the UK media as us offering an associate membership uh, to the United Kingdom. I just want to say here uh, that this was very much not our focus, but really our thinking was if the EU extends to 30, 35 or even more member states, there needs to be a, a more flexible uh, integration and the openness for countries who do not want to be part of a closer political integration to be associated to the single market without becoming uh, a full EU members. What we did not want to do is to say this is an alternative to enlargement, uh, but rather uh, this is only for those countries who do not want to be fully politically integrated uh, into, into the EU. Now I want to address the, the second question, and this is maybe uh, also one of the politically most controversial ones, is how, how to get, get there. And Per Vange already said we are sort of in a typical European process. Uh, the EU has now decided to open up accession negotiations with Ukraine, Moldova, and potentially Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and there's going to be some kind of roadmap for the future uh, adopted after um, after the uh, EU elections uh, together with the strategic agenda uh, in June. Um, and there is this 2030, maybe even later date floating around in Brussels when this enlargement is actually going to, uh, going to happen. Um, and uh, this is very strongly connected to the question of treaty change, uh, where we adopted in the group the position that uh, from our perspective, first we wanted to look at the uh, reforms itself, 
and not decide everything on the question of treaty change. So uh, following the principle of form follows functions, we first outline which are the reforms we thought would be necessary to prepare the EU for 30, 35 members, and then address the questions, does that require treaty change? And coming from that and from some of the proposals uh, Pervanche and I outlined on some, but not if on all of them, we came to the conclusions they are only implementable if there are some changes to the treaty, not a fundamental reform like the Lisbon Treaty, but some targeted adaptation um, of, of the treaty. Um, uh, but how to get there? Uh, we said there are also several options. Uh, the clearest option would be a traditional treaty change with, with the convention uh, where all of these changes were implemented. But we know full well that this is quite controversial and tricky in many, many EU member states, including in Ireland. So we said uh, or outlined other options, for instance, uh, introducing these changes, uh, the necessary changes uh, via the accession treaty. So together with the accession, so that uh, the reforms would also come into, uh, come into place by the time the first new member uh, joins uh, joins the European uh, Union. But at the end of the day, this will be a political choice uh, by the, the member states uh, of the EU, whether and in how far they are willing to adapt the treaties uh, uh, and make these changes uh, for, for enlargement. Which brings me to my to the final uh, point as we are already uh, sort of closing in into uh, half past uh, one or half past two uh, where I'm sitting, uh, and this is uh, the reactions uh, and and the path uh, ahead. And we presented the ideas of this report uh, last September uh, to the General Affairs uh, Council uh, to colleagues uh, from uh, the European Commission and and many others. And um, I think it's fair to say that it has helped amongst other contributions uh, to really stimulate uh, the debate on how the EU should adapt in light of this uh, enlargement. Um, and at uh, the December Council, um, together with the decision to open accession negotiation with Ukraine and Moldova, uh, the heads of states and government of all EU countries with, let's say, a creative coffee break uh, by Viktor Orban, uh, decided um, additionally uh, that not only the member states, uh, the candidate countries need to reform to become members of the European Union, but that the European Union itself needs, needs to reform. And so clearly enshrining this principle that both enlargement process and reform should go parallel hand in hand, and that this is one of the geostrategic tasks for the EU uh, in the in the next uh, years uh, to come without setting a specific date, nor with setting a specific framework on which reforms would actually be on the discussion. So the consensus that there is now between the EU member states, I would say, is on a very, very general level, an acceptance that reform and enlargement should go hand in hand and take and should be discussed in parallel. Uh, but I think we are still far away uh, from a consensus of which of these reforms proposals that others and we outlined would actually be uh, picked up. And from the feedback of the member states and different national go uh, governments, I would say the ideas um, and this principle that Pavanche also highlighted of not aiming for a fundamental transformation of the EU, but rather adapting the institutions uh, to be ready for 30, 35 countries was well received as a pragmatic and serious kickoff to the discussions. But many, many member states are or continue to be very reluctant to engage in discussions that would require treaty change. Um, and are looking uh, to find flexible uh, solutions that, in their point of view, could be adapted within the framework of uh, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and so I think a major decision uh, for, uh, for the EU ahead, for all EU countries, including uh, Germany and France, but uh, also Ireland, um, will be on how to actually sort of synchronize these two negotiations on 
enlargement and reform in the in the upcoming uh, legislative period when enlargement uh, can happen and how far and ambitious the reforms uh, should be in order to prepare the EU and and whether and in which form uh, that in sh should include also some changes uh, to the to the EU treaties and this would maybe be our uh, sort of kick off to the ideas uh, we look forward to the to the questions and the discussions well thank you both very much indeed um you you've certainly given us um a great deal to to talk about and and to think about um if I may, I'll, I'll ask the first question. You've had the benefit of um, insider discussions, if I can call it that, with members of the Council, of the Commission, and, and of the Parliament, and others indeed. Um, are, are you, you, and one of the phrases you use there in describing um, the, the attitude towards uh, dealing with treaty change is of reluctance because of sensitivities. Are you perhaps a little disappointed at the uh, what, what appears to be a gap between uh, the stated aim of the um, Union to enlarge, including to Ukraine, and the lack of uh, concrete um, progress on the sort of changes that you are, you've outlined um, will be necessary. I'm thinking in particular of your report where you highlighted the opportunity to do a number of things before or in the context of the European Parliament elections, which are now only, as we were saying, seven or eight weeks away. Yeah, maybe I can start and Nicola will, will complete. I mean, your, your question is straight to the point. Huh? And uh, please do remember our report was for the European Council and not for the European Parliament. Huh? Because as you know, in parallel to our work, the Parliament uh, took a completely different road and we didn't want to yeah. follow this road. I mean, there are, there are some juncture between the, the two reports by but the Parliament's report is something that might be uh, interesting for history, but that will not be swallowed uh, by the European Council when we wanted to have a leverage here. And our leverage, I would say, was the first thing was to, and we had long discussion about this, was to define a timetable, because we know in the EU method it's a good, it's a it used it in principle it's a successful uh, method. Mm. So we also decide longly discussed what uh, should be this timetable, and we decided it should be two thousand thirteen to make sure the EU is mm. ready for the enlargement. Which means it's not as usual when we discuss enlargement country candidate country needs to be ready we need to be ready which means the next mandate i mean it's it's a, quite a paradox huh? also in terms of public opinion because uh, the whole european parliament selection campaign i don't know how it's in ireland and or in germany but in france i can tell you no one is going to discuss enlargement because mm -hmm. this is not popular but the mandate of the next uh, parliament and the next commission is to get the EU ready for this next enlargement. Yeah. Uh, also, because of geostrategic reason, even if it's not enough for enlargement, this is also a good reason to do it. And this tension that you are mentioning is everywhere in the Council. Mm -hmm. This is why I think one of the options that we have open, uh, which is to bridge the two. Because some people are completely opposed to enlargement, even though they don't dare to say it, but they know their public opinion is not ready for that. And uh, But you cannot honestly consider the state of the play uh, of the decision process in the EU and say uh, that it's, it's already functioning today. Uh, so even without enlargement, it's true that you need reform. But the... There's absolutely no appetite for a treaty change for many reasons, and I think our two countries have contributed to this. Huh? Um, so to overcome this difficulty, you have to clearly define the timetable. 2000, 2013 is a point of rendezvous where you need to be ready. But uh, the, and we are not uh, we are not um, 
I think we are very one of the reasons why this report can be useful is we are not completely out of the world in our proposal. We are very pragmatic and we take stock of uh, the, the, the state of the play. So uh, somehow our proposals are ambitious, but they are realistic. And when they are realistic is to say you cannot have an EU functioning of 37 member states without flexibility. And you cannot have the needed flexibility inside the community method, which is the one where member states can feel at ease um, without uh, treaty change. This is the key. The, the key yeah? mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, my thinking is that because of this resistance to any treaty change, the way to do it is really to lick the two. You will have enlargement because of your strategic reason. And to do this, to achieve this, well, you need to have the, the treaty change. Um, and you, But you're right. I think more could have been done, including ahead of the European Parliament's election. This, this didn't happen so much, but it's not a reason uh, to give up. And uh, one, the basis for this Franco-German uh, compromise, I think, I mean, We've been quite, uh, we, we have demonstrated where Franco Germans uh, working together, Frank, Frank, French and German working together can be helpful. Because we've been doing proposal that goes against uh, the, the well known interest of our two member states. Because we know if you want the EU to function better, you need more qualified majority. And it's not enough to say where you want more qualified majority. You need also to define how it applies, because otherwise you never, you will never get other countries uh, uh, to accept uh, the deal. Because as uh, Nicola rightly said, other countries believe that if you keep the state of the play as it's currently uh, on the table, it's only a coalition, a Franco-German plus one country or two countries that can make the deal, which is not uh, fair. Even though we have seen uh, in the recent negotiation on the uh, platform workers that uh, Fran French and Germany can be uh, uh, put in minority, but it's an exception that doesn't co confirm the rule. So this is the spirit in, in which we've been working, accepting to move unqualified majority to change the the, the 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 criteria for the qualified majority to make it helpful for decision making process in the EU. Maybe to I add, you wish to add uh, yes please thoughts on, on the question of disappointment. I think where um we were at least happy to see that there has been progress on the discussion. We remember that uh, we made a presentation of our interim ideas around uh, May last year, so roughly a year after the European Council said first time uh, Ukraine would be a candidate country. And there the majority of member states hadn't even thought about all these ideas. They basically mm -hmm. said, okay, we need to talk with our capitals. Uh, there's no formed opinions. Um, and just three, four months later in September, we saw that really this discussion was triggered and the European Council was able to say in Granada and then in, in December to say, okay, these two processes, we all agree need to go hand in hand. So I think this is an achievement, uh, yeah. not only by us, I think all sort of many people work together on that, uh, but I think there the, the report contributed to that. Um, what I think we've also seen is, um, and this is maybe where the disappointment comes part comes in, that there are many countries which are in favor of enlargement, but are very hesitant uh, to address some of these questions. Um, the biggest example is probably Poland, very, very strongly in favor of enlargement of Ukraine, uh, but suddenly seeing uh, what even the opening up of some of the trade borders and, uh, mm -hmm. is doing to their farmers, to their workers, uh, and is suddenly pushing back. Um, others like uh, Denmark very strongly in favor of enlargement saying uh, we need to uh, adapt uh, the decision making but then very clearly saying as Denmark is also one of the countries which need to have a referendum uh, we don't want any treaty change and I think this confrontation between on the one hand saying this is in our geostrategic interest we want the EU to enlarge and confronting the difficult questions that will only come if there is progress on the enlargement uh, 
question uh, and if member states are being sort of pushed to confront these questions. And there, I think disappointed is maybe too strong a word, but we learned again that this um, political instinct to push the difficult questions into the future and only address them when they have to be, absolutely have to be addressed, is very much alive in many EU member states, uh, so that they agree now on the general principle of re reform, but are very, very reluctant so far to really come to a sort of, uh, to, to come to a conclusion, which reforms do we actually want to uh, agree, and when is our point of time when we, when we need to strike that agreement. Well, exactly. And this, your report and discussions like this, I hope, will, will help to push that process um, forward. So the first question I have from the, the audience is from Dara Lawler, who works as a researcher at the Institute. And it goes as follows, a rather <clears throat> particularly Irish um, concern. In an enlarged European Union, do you propose to extend qualified majority voting at the Council to tax issues? Evidently, this would be of particular interest to Ireland, particularly in the sphere of corporate tax. Who'd like to take that, <laughs> the corporate tax? We, we, we both can can go there, but uh, Nika, you want to start this time or? Yeah, I can I can start this time. So um, our uh, we made the proposal to say um, all policy decisions, so not constitutional ones like changing the treaties or accepting new members, those should remain anonymous, but all policy decisions uh, should come, uh, should fall under qualified majority voting. Um, but also that we could think about sort of different, different packages um, between uh, policy areas. And uh, certainly, uh, I think uh, tax policy is one where the French side would be a little bit more interested in putting that under qualified majority voting, whereas uh, speaking sort of from what I know for the German government, there would be a little bit more hesitation, even though Olaf Scholz also included tax policy as one of the examples for qualified majority in his uh, Prague speech in 2022. Um, and so, yes, indeed, uh, our proposal would be to, to include that. Um, however, uh, with these uh, additional points that we put in every area where we propose to extend uh, qualified majority voting, which would be uh, a, a form of what we call a sovereignty safety net, so a safety clause where vital national interests are at stake, uh, the options for, for opt-out for new areas that would fall under qualified majority uh, voting, and this rebalancing uh, between, uh, between larger and uh, smaller member states. Uh, but I think it's clear um, at least from our point of view, that for the EU's capacity to act, if we think about an EU 35 country uh, of 30, 35 countries, uh, then most, if not all, policy decisions really need to fall under qualified majority voting. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, quite, uh, uh, quite easily um, blocked. Um, and I would also argue uh, that uh, outvoting our qualified majority voting is usually not used as a tool to outvote large groups of member states, but rather to forge compromises, because mm -hmm. then countries need to coordinate and uh, compromise from the very outset uh, of, of negotiations. Uh, and this could be a helpful tool uh, for all member states if discussions also on, on tax policies would from the outset be uh, organized towards uh, tax policies. And we saw in the OECD uh, debate that Irish diplomacy is quite uh, task and uh, very adept uh, also in handling these discussions. So I wouldn't have a question about Ireland still being able to push its own interests, uh, even uh, in areas where discussions uh, and decisions are made by qualified majority voting. Very interesting. And thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Perpunch, do you wish to add to that, or is that yeah, comprehensive? Point, yeah, just just one point because, I mean, our principle in approaching this question of the scope of a qualified majority is that it should uh, policies should be decided by uh, a qualified majority, huh? And uh, but uh, for purpose of uh, compromise and uh, of uh, negotiation, we we had defined three blocks, huh? Uh, enlargement and rule of law, foreign policies and defense, 
fiscal and tax policy. So tax policy would clearly come with uh, the fiscal issue. And here I think what uh, Nicola, because uh, this goes hand in hand of the with the question of uh, the uh, giving up the, the veto right somehow huh? that uh, unanimity gives you. And this is where the, what uh, Nicola has mentioned regarding the sovereign safety net uh, is for us uh, critical, which means uh, we can we we observe can observe that in the council sometimes a veto right is also observed is also used as a hostage for that another aspect of the discussion, and uh, the the principle of this uh, uh, sovereign safety net is to oblige uh, minister but also heads of states and government to consider uh, the, the 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 difficulty. Or, or the question that is raised by one member state per se, without melting all the other points on the table, just to be able to address the question and the issue uh, the member state wants to relate, to 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 raise, and just to make sure that uh, if this uh, uh, is related to a real uh, somehow objective national interest, it can be considered discussed, explain, and then solved. Somehow it's the method we have used in this Franco-German working group that we want to extend, which is in this atmosphere that was not at the top uh, between the head of states and government and the different uh, members of the government. Just be around the table, explain your position, and then you can agree even on, on, uh, on defense or on uh, 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 an EU uh, new uh, uh, borrowing capacity, which we have included in the report, which was not uh, obvious uh, in the start. But it's a, it's really, a, I would have said, it's a new method spirit huh, that we have uh, tried to apply here. Thank you. Thank you both very much. So the second question comes from um, staffer at the Michael McGuire at the um, European Commission office. He asks, uh, what are your views on creating a mechanism to expel member states in the case of persistent uh, breaches of rule of law standards? For example, a kind of super Article 7, he calls it. Mm -mm. We, we discussed it. Huh? Do we want an exclusion uh, clause? And we say no. This is why we have introduced this flexibility. This is why we have introduced, I mean, I have to go to a, a more detailed uh, approach, but it's critical here. We have mentioned the uh, fiscal compact uh, as, as a feasible option for the future. What does it mean? It means, you remember with the fiscal compact, there was an imposition by German, by UK for such a treaty. Uh, they were not interested in it. And uh, so the member states and govern, heads of state and government have designed a special treaty using the commission and the council institution inside the treaty. The only one that was left aside was the human parliament, which, which is a problem that would need to be solved in the future if you would replicate this solution, but which is a treaty, um, a side of the treaty. And uh, what we suggest is that if there's a, an opposition to, uh, to a way uh, uh, where there's a coalition of the willing to go ahead and that there's a treaty change that would not be accepted, then you have the demonstration that you can go for such a solution that uh, you draw a side uh, treaty. Um, it's not the best, it's not the favorite option, but mm. this is the way to do it, which means you don't expel, it's the member state that expelled itself uh, by its behavior and by its not willingness. We we had the same thinking about um, the repatriation of, compet of uh, competences. You remember in the Brexit debate, there was this whole debate, uh, where's the list of competence you want to repatriate? And the, on the, the answer was empty because no one was able to define what they want to repatriate. So it's not to us, it's not to the EU to say you can repatriate this and this, it's to the one who are willing not to follow the, the mainstream to, to say what they want. And this is why we refuse to have an expulsion uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, but this is not to say we, we said nothing about the rule of law. I, as I mentioned in the beginning, we do, I think, the more efficient and the more pragmatic way to improve the tools, the legal tools for the rule of law would be 
to enlarge the scope of the conditionality to Article 2 of the truth. Yeah. Maybe and of course, to, to, to add add absolutely. That is also our idea was, or our um, in the group, the the uh, the impression was that if you introduce an expulsion clause, you would fundamentally change the constitutional nature of the EU. Uh, if suddenly a member state uh, could be expelled, and this would hang up there in the air, um, this tool of expelling a member state and also uh, taking away the citizens' rights uh, of the citizens, even, even those citizens would, which uh, potentially have not voted for the government in place, yeah. would really change the fundamental nature uh, of the EU. And there we, we really said, as, as, as Pavosh has said, rather strengthen Article 7. Already in theory, under Article 7, you can take away the voting rights, which is the strongest uh, sort of membership rights uh, a country uh, has. Um, and, and we said, Please strengthen that and not turn the EU into a, uh, a club where countries and by that also their citizens could be expelled against their will because that would really change uh, the, the basis of the EU and also the, the ways of working if countries suddenly would start to sort of discuss expelling one of their members uh, that would certainly poison the, the cooperation in the EU. Mm -hmm. The next question is from uh, Alan Jukes, who's a former minister of the Irish government. So Alan comes to the point of synchronizing the, the reform and the enlargement. The synchronization of institutional reform and enlargement cannot avoid the necessity for treaty change, since any institutional reform and enlargement itself requires such change. Could this imply a series of treaty changes at various stages uh, of a series of enlargement events, the regatta version of enlargement? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so maybe I can I can start this time. We had a lot of discussions about whether this next enlargement, how it could uh, could take place, and we came to the to the conclusion that the most likely scenario is really one of regatta, not sort of a big bang enlargement where all potentially nine countries would join the EU in one go, but rather you might have different groups, uh, for instance, the uh, the avant-garde in the Western Balkans or uh, Ukraine and Moldova uh, joining together rather than, than having one big bang. Uh, nevertheless, from our point of view, the necessary reforms would need to happen uh, by the time the first new member, uh, the first new country becomes a member state of the EU. Uh, so really uh, that the reform is in place when this enlargement happens. Um, and this might also be a point of controversy uh, or difference between our report and what many member states are thinking uh, at the moment. So our, our thinking was quite clear that enlargement should only happen if reform happens, whereas most member states, I think, have accepted that these two processes should happen in parallel, but not necessarily that one should be conditional on the other. So for instance, you will hear a German official saying, we need to have these two processes hand in hand, but if you, pros, if you press them, they will not necessarily say enlargement can only happen if there's reform beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. our, our point of view, and I would certainly stick to that, is uh, no, we should say, we should not fall into the trap of uh, doing enlargement first uh, and then trying to reform with an EU of 35, but rather by the time the first country uh, joins, uh, that reform should be, should be agreed and in place. I think um, I have a second yeah. question, or a further question in that vein, asking, for example, if Montenegro were to meet the accession criteria before 2030, would they be accepted into the union at that time? I, I think you've answered that question through, if, if I'm not mistaken, through what you've already said. Yeah, if a country were to meet the criteria before 2030. Yeah. But then, I mean, sometimes you can, legal expert can be very creative to find solution, but you would need to, I mean, I'm just thinking now, we have not uh, uh, envisaged this scenario while drafting the report, but you could imagine that if this was the case, and Montenegro certainly is a specific case because it's not uh, the biggest, it's not Ukraine huh, coming into the EU. So you can see also the signal and blah, 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 that uh, would uh, uh, 
push some member states in this direction. But then you would need to have some kind of revision clause uh, in, in this treaty to make sure you could integrate the new reform that would be settled for everyone uh, after it would be a reform. But if you go into the into the report, one of the bases for the drafting of the report was to have option. And this is also what makes it uh, quite useful for the political discussion that is now uh, opening. And in the option, one of the option is to have what we called a framework treaty, which means it's the treaty for the institutional reform that you defined as the framework one and that you implement in each uh, enlargement treaty. And this can be uh, something that uh, could fit in. But of course, the case you're raising is, uh, would the EU be completely ready to, uh, to, and, and, yeah, to, 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 to end the negotiation of its own uh, institutional reform uh, as soon as this one? Uh, this is for me the political challenge that is now in the hand of the council, in the Human Council. As Nicola said, the two last conclusion were better than nothing. I mean, uh, to start with, when you had the, I mean, let's be frank, when the commission came out saying the, the we can open the negotiation with Ukraine, full stop, uh, we had a problem. But when the European Council came with these two paragraphs in the two conclusion that you need to have the two in parallel, we need to stick to this roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not easy. Also, because somehow the dynamic of the two uh, process are in the hand of two different institutions. The treaty reform is merely solely in the hand of the head of states and government. When the enlargement process, of course, the opening of the negotiation and the closing of the negotiation in, is the, in the hand of the heads of states and government. But the whole day-to-day uh, -day business is in the hand of the commission. And so you can see that in the willingness to demonstrate that you are on the good track, you can have the commission very offensive on the uh, on the enlargement, and letting the head of states and government in the met, in in the mess of the reform of the treaty. And this cannot be. So this is why the right balance in the conclusion of the European Council is very important. And this is why I think what will come out. Uh, as a roadmap in in the uh, strategic uh, roadmap in 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 June, is very important, and I hope our report can help in this uh, direction. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to run two questions together that have come in from uh, Barry Kalfer, who's the director. Uh, you've met Barry, uh, uh, director of research at the IIEA. One asks um, in relation to your proposal for the. EU to issue common debt in the future, given that there has been some experience of this with NGEU following uh, COVID-19, that it can be done effectively. What are the main barriers to this becoming a core EU competency or procedure? And his second question uh, notes that your paper calls for more enhanced cooperation between smaller groups of member states to finance policies together. Can you say something about what sort of things that that those might be. Perhaps uh, you, if you wish, you may split those between yourselves in the interest of fitting in as much as we can in the short remaining time. Nicola, take the one you want. Okay, I can maybe because the objections from the German side are more on the second one, I can I can take one. Uh, I can take that one. Uh, first, maybe saying that within our group, we rarely have ever had any kind of sort of the French here and the Germans on the other side uh, disagreements. Uh, but the one that maybe came closest to that was the one on, on joint borrowing, uh, which is uh, something um, where certainly the governments have very different uh, different positions as we see currently for the debate on some kind of defense uh, borrowing in, in the mm -hmm. future. And maybe the German position on or the 
I think the French position on that is it should happen on the basis of the current treaty. It was possible on next generation EU and should be done on other challenges, including uh, on, uh, on defense. And the German position is uh, that this uh, next generation EU uh, borrowing was a temporary one-time crisis measure and that, in, uh, and that this should not easily be replicated. And if it does so, uh, it needs a change in the treaty because the German constitutional court um, ruled that it was uh, legal for uh, during the pandemic, but only under these exceptional circumstances of a crisis. And if there is some kind of permanent borrowing capacity, uh, that would require a change to the treaty uh, of a competence of the of the EU uh, to do that. And then finally, there are, of course, these more philosophical differences between, uh, let's say, more frugal countries, uh, which are very wary of risk sharing and further uh, joint debt uh, and countries who say for the Eurozone to function properly, for the EU to function properly, it needs its own fiscal capacity uh, and the possibility to, to borrow uh, jointly. Uh, and here, I think the jury is still open um, and might be decided on defense, whether next generation EU was a one-off event, uh, like the Germans like to say, or whether it's a template for further uh, joint borrowing, uh, like France and others are pushing for. For the other question, on yeah, I think it's just uh, useful to recall what we have uh, written in the report. We all we would also draw on the positive experience of the next generation EU by enabling enabling the EU to issue common debt in the future. Full stop. And this, and we had a round uh, uh, agreement uh, of all the members of the expert group. So this is the state of the play, and I think it's a it's an important point also in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, to come. I would say when it comes to uh, uh, financing some special project among some member states, this is exactly an example of where we have applied the principle of being conservative and flexible. Conservative meaning we want to make it possible for member state to have such a, uh, to finance such project, but we wanted to do it inside the community method and not outside. And the way to allow this it to, is to be creative and to accept um, some flexibility with the budget rules are uh, 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 put in place, which means uh, if you would have, for example, let's take uh, uh, the one concrete example that has been uh, um, currently uh, 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 pushed on, on the project for uh, batteries where France and Germany have been pushing a project. Well, instead of doing it on a bilateral basis or with the willing member state, you would do it inside the framework of the commission, but only the member state willing to participate to this project uh, would have to contribute to it. But it would be under the, the leadership, the authority and the legitimacy of the commission, which means it's not a subject for exclusion of others, it's inside an open box where member state can join at any time, inclusive. Thank you both very much. I think uh, we've come to the end of our time. There are more questions, both on my own part and on part of uh, some of the audience. I apologize for not being able to reach them all, but I do want to extend very sincere thanks uh, to both of you for uh, your generosity with your time and, and with your insights um, uh, and that uh, those that derive from the work of the group as well, because innovation is required in, in relation to finding solutions to these complicated, uh, complex issues of the interlocking issues of enlargement and reform and the paper uh, and your explanations of it uh, and, and your contacts in the context of that are extremely valuable. So we look forward to hearing from uh, the European Council. I think the phrase used was uh, by the summer of 2024. So we're waiting to see when exactly the summer the summer falls. And given the uh, given the scope of the the topic, but also of your paper, it would be tremendously useful and interesting to hear from both of you again in the future as this process um, on, on, unfolds, perhaps in the context of the. Um, the relationship we have with the SVP and the IIEA, or, or perhaps in the context of your uh, a return visit uh, to the to the IIEA. 
Thank you both very much. Thank you to the audience for the questions. Thank you for the engagement. It's good to see this discussion getting underway. Thank you.